Abdul Rahman Rasul was just another ordinary citizen. A businessman, devoted husband, father of five daughters, and described generally around his community in Maluk Ward in Imbala City as a gentle, kind soul. He had never had any run-ins with the law either. Yet his death reads like a script for a murder mystery or a crime thriller movie, a small altercation, a jumbled criminal trial, quick sentencing, and in less than three weeks, he was dead in prison. Then, the finger pointing by officials and roadblocks met by his family in the desperate search for not just answers, but justice as well. Their nerving experience has left his family physically, emotionally, and financially distraught. The insensitive sounding prison authorities told the family that Rasul died of natural causes, but pictures of the body taken by Duguda suggest otherwise. Prison authorities at Ngenge, who declined to speak to NTV, offered the family varying accounts. One Wada, according to the family members, claimed that he is choked on porridge and all attempts to resuscitate him at the prison infirmary failed. Another Wada told the family that he is choked on drinking water and died en route to the nearest health center. And Benoist to the Wadas, a well-wisher took the deceased photos shortly after death. The gory images copies seen by NTV detail what appear to be heavy torture marks by beating and his legs appear to have been broken. During the Muslim ritual of Guslaya Mekta washing the deceased body by relatives, family members were horrified more. One of the deceased testicles had been crushed and his tongue to cut off. The family believes Rasul's death was a hit job inside Ngenge prison in Kapchora district. Ali had 10 million shillings in the pocket. I have witnesses. Ali stood in front of my office and banged the pocket. Muko, um, I swear upon the living God, I will invest this 10 million to kill Abdurrahman. You know, as the youngest, I was much involved in their feds. But then, when Rasul was sent to prison, I started hearing stories. You know, this is a small town, that he was suffering a lot in Maluku. I brought it to the attention of our mother because she is very close to Ali. But when mom asked Ali, he just brushed off the claims. When my husband was first sent to Maluku, it was quite hard. Ali took it upon himself to make it worse. He approached our landlord and asked him to throw us out of the house, saying that the deceased was in prison and I didn't have any money to pay. He then remarked that in prison, my husband will pay a heavy price. On what basis was he saying this? But how did the sad episode begin? It all started as a wrangle over family property, particularly between the deceased, opposed to the cell, and his young brother, Al Rasul Sikimbo. The said property, scattered around in Bali City, was bequeathed by their grandfather to their father. After their father's death in 2001, their elder brother, Abdul Rasul Salah, was installed as the heir. 23 years later, both Abdul Rasul Salah, their elder brother, and the heir, and the youngest brother in the family, Shuri Abdul Rasul, say they are living in fear as a result of scrambling over the property. Ali has also promised to send me away. I don't know what he means by that, but he seems powerful around here. Anytime Shuri or their elder sister Sarah could be the next. Ali actually told Shuri that harming you doesn't take a second because you're like a mosquito. Shuri recalled that they were veiled threats against Rasul, but they brushed them off. 
I was inclined to give Ali the benefit of the doubt, but when he heard of our brother's death, he rather celebrated the news. He went to the bar and drank so much while saying his problems have been taken care of. Never did they expect the wrangle to escalate. Ali seems to have cast a spell on our mother. I told her several times about Rasul's plight in prison and begged her to rein in on Ali to pardon his brother, but she ignored my pleas. Like I said, this is a small town. I once heard that in Maluku, Rasul had been made to sleep in a pit like a dog. I don't think dogs are even treated like that. This account is reinforced by his brother-in-law, Abdallah Aziz, and paternal aunt, Leila Abdu Rahman. This guy was, was tortured to death. He has marks of torture. As Muslims, we wash bodies. You get it? We wash when we are going to bury. The guy was beaten. One of the testicles were outside. He, he had the burns, burns on the, on the, on the legs. He had cuts. We have fresh photos. We have even photos when the guy was, after being killed, the guy was put in, in a brand new uniform in prison. We have photos. Ali really harassed his brother using all sorts of means. Rasul was staying at one of their family property. And Ali went there one time and disconnected the water, then cut the sewer pipes. And sewage flooded all over the house, all in the name of making them leave the house. When that failed, he bribed the LC to evict his brother, saying he didn't have a right to live there. Actually, I need... Then came the miscarriage of justice that resulted in a death. The deceased widow narrated how the sibling rivalry unraveled on March 20th, 2022, when his brother-in-law, Al-Rasul Sikimbo, severely beat her up, causing severe bodily harm. I had gone to help out at my sister-in-law's, the eldest brother's wife, Sarah, who was due to give birth. On the way, I passed by my mother-in-law, but her actions made it clear that I was unwelcome there. I proceeded to where I was going. That is where Ali descended on me in a fit of rage and started beating me up. Salah's wife was too pregnant to intervene, and in the process, I lost three teeth. She had notified her husband, now the disease of her movements that afternoon. To her luck, her husband had planned to join her at his eldest brother's home where he found his wife being beaten. I was all bloodied when my husband arrived. He separated his brother from me and then a scuffle ensued between the two. Ali immediately rushed to police to report that I had assaulted my mother-in-law and that my husband had beaten him up. Police immediately picked up my husband and while in detention, he later told me that they tried to force him to sign some papers, but it was dark in the cells, which he refused. He suspected they were related to the family property for which papers they have forged to lay claim. A case of assault was reported at Imbali City Police. To the family's surprise, in no time, Sikimbo had been released on bond. When we also reported our case to the police family division, they really tried to mediate because they believed it was a family wrangle. But Sikimbo himself frustrated everything by not showing up for meetings. The case ultimately went to trial and on April 17th, 2024, Sikimbo was convicted in absentia of the offence of causing bodily harm contrary to Section 236 of the Penal Code Act. The court finds that the prosecution proved beyond reasonable doubt that the accused was the aggressor of the complainant, ruled Grade 1 Magistrate Hope Tendo Modega. Family members recall the magistrate as saying that the offense carried five years in prison. To their surprise, when the accused Sikimbo turned up for sentencing, two weeks later, on April 29, 2024, the magistrate changed goalposts, reasoning that 
court is mindful of the fact that the injuries inflicted on the complainant caused to spend in treatment for which she should be compensated, although no receipts were think presented in court to aid in assessment. The convict has also made his plea for a non-custodial sentence by providing medical aims to highlight his medical condition, that's to say, hypertension and diabetes that require special treatment. There is need for the parties to reconcile and settle their disputes as a family and this can only be achieved through communication. Taking all the above into consideration, the court will not impose a custodial sentence to allow room for reconciliation. Taking into consideration the injuries sustained and expenses incurred by the complainant, a compensatory order is appropriate. The convict is hereby sentenced to compensation of 800,000 shillings, 700,000 shillings of which shall be paid to the complainant and she be paid as fine to the government. Let's be straightforward. There is no transparency in the court of law. More especially here in Imbala again, it is becoming worse. Money started exchanging hands. As we thought the case has been uh, the ruling, now they went and forged that according to now the deceased called me and told me, you know what, brother, come and see. They've ruled, they've said that us family members, we sat and agreed that Ali Rasul pays Barbara 700,000 for three tooth removed. Now the deceased refused that no, I will not accept the, the ruling. He wanted to go and do the appeal. The family said they were shocked to hear the defense plead that the matter had been amicably settled as a family and there were minutes to that effect. The family maintains that there was never such a meeting and the said minutes were forgery but their pleas were disregarded. We reached out to Sikimbo for his side of the story but he declined to speak to us. On May 9, 2024, Nisha's husband complained to the Director of Public Prosecution's Regional Office in Imbale City, the sentence given to his young brother vis-à-vis -vis the bodily harm he caused to his wife. Father, the convict has been trailing my movements with intention to have me because of this case, the complaint reads in part. He added, Secondly, the alleged mediation meeting failed because the convict's bad conduct of abusing and undermining authorities only, lamenting how he can bribe all judicial officials to exonerate him from whatever charge he may have committed. It is from the above reasons I am dissatisfied with the magistrate's sentence to compensation of 700,000 shillings, hence this complaint. The DPP's office responded on May 14th, acknowledging receipt of the complaint and asking the complainant to forward the case papers to enable us to attend to the complaint. The letter sent me and told me, uh, being a brother, in, I was talking to both. He told me, brother, can you kindly go and tell your, your, your muko to just put the teeth of my wife? Because tomorrow I will die. My wife is still young. Who will marry, who will marry her? I was very concerned. I got my phone, I called that brother of mine in law called Ali. Ali came to my office where it is at Naboa Road, plot number 41. When Ali came, I told Ali, you know what? Uh, your, your brother is as, and the, the wife, they've said they are ready to, they don't want to appeal or do anything. What they want, kindly buy, buy those three tooth. In fact, I asked them from the same day hospital here. They told me replacing his tooth is 500,000. I told him, what is 1.5 million? Replace that lady's tooth. You've, you know, a woman is, if you damage a woman's face, you've damaged all her property on the, on the body. Ali had 10 million shillings in the pocket. I have witnesses. Ali stood in front of my office and banged the pocket. Muko, um, I swear upon the living God, I will invest this 10 million to kill Abdurrahman, but... I will not buy even a single tooth. I thought it was a joke. What happened next is a roller coaster of events. Rasul was rearrested on an earlier charge of assaulting and occasioning bodily harm on Sikimbo. According to the family, Sikimbo accused his elder brother of beating him up after chancing on each other at the site on one of the contested property back in March 2022. The case the family maintains was a tit for tat for Rasul to drop the assault case against Sikimbo for beating Nisha. 
The brother-to-brother assault case had clogged in the justice system, but in a twist of events, the deceased was re-arrested. Conversely, the deceased had earlier in March 2023 written to Mbale Magistrate's Court complaining about the unfairness of his trial at the Magistrate Grade 2 Court. He wrote, During the hearing, one of the witnesses was not cross-examined and despite prayer by the defense, his evidence was expunged. Secondly, the police officer who is investigating officer testified without statement or a report. The deceased father wrote, Thirdly, I have established that the complainant is a very close friend of the trial magistrate and the two have been cited at Pavement Pub on Nkokonjuri Terrace and Sports Club. In the circumstances, I believe that the trial magistrate is compromised and cannot judiciously handle my case. I pray that this case suit be relocated to another trial magistrate for a fair trial. The family says Rasul was in the process of appealing the April 29th judgment of the assault case of beating his wife. He was, however, arrested for the assault of his young brother and remanded for 14 days. After the 14 days, Rasul was sentenced by the magistrate grade to court to six months in Maluku government prison in Imbali City. The magistrate disregarded the deceased pleas that he was a first-time offender or the argument that the matter could be handled amicably by the family, which arguments were advancing the assault case against his wife. To live there, actually, I knew the magistrate. She was called fortunate or something. Who handled the assault case? She used to buy groceries here and her children too would play here sometime. I was delighted. I was delighted when I learned she was handling the file, for I thought it would engage her openly for common sense to prevail. When I attempted, she shooed me away, saying it was illegal and that I would bias her. I was really surprised for someone I had known for a while to treat me like that. Just like that, Rasul was sent away to meet his death. I went to the magistrate court with my children to plead for leniency, but the magistrate was too insensitive. I told her my husband was the sole breadwinner and that there was more background to this case to be considered. But she said she doesn't care and that she has seen worse before. And just like that, our pleas were disregarded. After barely a week in Maluku government prison, the family learned that Rasul was now being transferred to Ngenge prison along the Muyembe Nakapipirit Road in Kapchura district. In fact, yeah. The last time I talked to him on the phone, it was the evening of the day before he was killed. He sounded in distress in fact, yeah. and was crying that he was being beaten severely. I was surprised because he had only been brought there three days before. I tried to comfort him and he asked that I send any money I had for buying some bites for he was being starved. I could hear noises in the background and a warder seemed to have grabbed the phone from him. I asked the warder on the line that why is it that you beat and starve inmates? But she just brushed me off saying my husband is a spoiled brat. Nonetheless, I wired 38,000 on the line in the names of Naki Inji. I came to think about it. It was as if I was paying a ransom. Hardly three days after the transfer, Ngenge prison authorities called Nisha, directing her to head to Mbale City Mortuary to retrieve her husband's body. The officer in charge of Maluku Prison, Maureen Ninsima, defended the transfer of Rasul as a routine to offer labor on the prison farm. She also rubbished off claims of foul play in his death, arguing that inmates die every other time, so he's not so special. If they want, they can go through court for exhumation of the body for a second post-mortem, but the cost will be on them, Miss Ninsima said. <laughs> We reached out to the Uganda prison spokesperson Frank Bene, who referred us to his deputy Moses Sentalo, who did not pick or return our repeated calls for comment on the matter. Nisha recalled she last spoke to Rasul the previous evening on the phone during which he complained about being beaten. 
At the Imbala City Mortuary, they found the postmortem already done, going against procedure of seeking opinion of the next of kin, in this case Nisha, as the wife. According to both the handwritten postmortem report and death certificates signed off by Barnabas Rwanza, Rasul died of aspiration pneumonia and acute gastritis. NTV subjected the postmortem for a secondary opinion by a pathologist in Kampala, but they failed to read nor make sense of what was scribbled down. Aspiration pneumonia, the medic explained, is a medical emergency, usually fatal if not handled quickly. It simply means something foreign went into the lungs through the airway, could be in liquid form, for example, water or juice or medication, including syrups or porridge. If the patient had a feeding tube inside that changed position, solid stuff such as food, gas, carbon monoxide, etc. However, in the report, they have not specified what exactly what the aspirant was. Once this foreign aspirant gets to the lungs, it causes infection to the lungs, hence pneumonia. The second cause of death which is gastritis, that is to say, the reddening, swelling and painful alimentary canal, usually up to the stomach, is due to lots of factors, could be medicines, infections, stress, etc. Therefore, the report is not very detailed, Lots of things are missing to come up with the conclusive cause of death, the pathologist noted on condition of anonymity. But what then explains to severe bruises of beatings and torture on the deceased abdomen, broken legs and crushed testicle? The family have sought answers from numerous officers, but they have been met by high walls of silence and finger pointing. Inexplicably, in Genge prison authorities told the family the marks on the legs are scratches from working in the cotton farm. But how could it be if the inmate hardly spent a week at the facility before his death? In Genge prison, it is known mass with allegations of torture and death of inmates, some of which have been documented. For Nisha, more tormenting is that they took a bank loan to inject into her business. Attempts to get a repayment extension have proved futile because the bank requested for a death certificate issued by the National Identification and Registration Authority, NIRA. However, NIRA rejected the poorly scrambled post-mortem report and death certificate while Mbali city mortuary authorities keep tossing her. The 37-year-old widow now has to raise five daughters on her own. For now, she and the family have been left to guess what exactly happened to their loved one. The gory photographs taken of the body are a key puzzle in unraveling what exactly happened to him during his less than week stay at Ingenge prison. But that would require a second inquest through court under the Inquests Act, which means more financial and mental exhaustion.